Hey everybody, it's your friendly neighborhood father Tony here, and joining me to discuss the Gospel of Thomas, or at least a little bit of it, is Bishop Timothy Mansfield. Hello, Bishop. Hello, Father. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. It's a lovely, sunny, early autumn day here in Sydney. Yeah. Just to accustom your visitors to thinking in a global frame. Our visitors will be listening to this in, like, you know, August, so it doesn't really matter. Right. <laughs> Time is irrelevant on the internet. You know. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to talk about the Gospel of Thomas. We uh, had a really kind of whirlwind conversation in the video portion about these three Logia, and I will read them to you really quickly right now so you caught up. We're going 25 through 27. So 25, Jesus said, Love your brother like your soul, guard him like the pupil of your eye. 26, Jesus said, You see the mote in your brother's eye, but you do not see the beam in your own eye. When you cast the beam out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to cast the mote from your brother's eye. And 27, Jesus said, If you do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as the Sabbath, you will not see the Father. So um, I'd like to share some of the correspondences that you see in the, um, in the various uh, canonical texts and plus other uh, parts of Nag Hammadi and other parts of the Gospel of Thomas that uh, relate. The first, uh, number 25, uh, shares uh, some, <coughs> some similarities with uh, part of Matthew. Um, but when the uh, but when the Pharisee Matthew twenty two thirty four through thirty uh, thirty four through forty you can't do thirty four through thirty that's silly. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. One of them said, which was a lawyer, and asked him the question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like unto it that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Of these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So um, the similarities there, of course, being uh, to love love thy neighbor, right, which is seen in the uh, in the logia, which is uh, love thy brother in this translation, but uh, it's it's neighbor in other translations as well, um, and uh, love thy neighbor uh, as thy soul, right, um, with all thy soul rather, which is very similar to. Uh, love thy neighbor like thy, like thy soul, which is in the Gospel of Thomas. So this is uh, I, further evidence that this particular document has relationship to the uh, mythical Q document, right? That is a um, supposedly the uh, predecessor for the three synoptic Gospels, which we do not have uh, access to this Q document, if you're not familiar with it. It is a hypothetical document created by scholars or um, posited by scholars to explain the similarities from the three synoptic gospels and a lot of the Gospel of Thomas as well. So, um, and it's and it's a and the thought is that it's a sayings gospel like Thomas is yes. a sayings gospel. It's, right. it's a non-narrative collection of um, neat things the Savior said. Right. Uh, some people say that Thomas is the Q document, but most scholars think that there is a, a whole separate document that uh, mm. is kind of the the source for a lot of these things. Um, and then there could even be a pre-Q document that, <laughs> that things <laughs> split off from. It, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're not uh, we're not biblical scholars in that in that particular way. But um, another another reference, Leviticus nineteen eighteen: Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So that is. Um, Another another point where Jesus is telling people, to, or uh, that they're 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 being told to love thy neighbor as as thyself. Um, this is this is often referred to as kind of the only commandment, right, of of Christianity, uh, the 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 new cov the commandment of the new covenant. That the uh, the old Ten Commandments, yeah, they're still pretty cool and we like them, but uh, when Jesus came, he kind of said. This is it. This is the core of what I'm teaching: is to love your neighbor, and uh, you know what? What was it that we were talking about earlier? <laughs> love everybody and don't have fights or something. Yeah, yeah. Be nice, don't fight. Be nice, don't fight. Yep. So uh, on the one hand, this can be a pretty um, a pretty superficial, you know. Yeah, it's it's great to be nice, and you know, it, uh, I, I think you'll see in a lot of. Um, 
Western Protestantism that uh, kind of the, there's a, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a, there's a, uh, an attitude that goes along with being a Christian, right? Being a good Christian involves, you know, um, being passive aggressively nice to people who you don't agree with, right? And I think that's kind of the, the idea. Well, bless your heart. Exactly. Oh, I will pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, that is a deep insult if you hear somebody say that, uh, <laughs> but uh, but they mean it in such a nice way. You are uh, clearly an idiot, but uh, <laughs> I love you anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you all the ways that you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on this, uh, Bishop? Yeah, a few. Um, I mean, I. I grew up in the Anglican Church in Australia, so the, um, that's, that manifests as the Episcopal Church of the USA in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and in the Eucharist service that I was familiar with as a kid, I've forgotten quite exactly when it happened, but the t those two great commandments, we, the priest read that out every single service. Mm -hmm. So I have those words kind of committed to heart, I guess, from when I was little. Um, I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul and all thy strength depending on exactly whose translation you're reading. Right. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I mean, that is, and that is the, that, that demand for love is a key part of how we understand the gospel message. I mean, this is really a pivotal saying. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that I think opens some space around this, uh, this niceness, this sort of friend of mine calls it the tyranny of the good, which I think is a phrase she um, Borrowed from the Marquis de Sade, <laughs> um, but this, uh, this sort of cloying sense of of niceness that it is to be a Christian. Um, what gets you out of that is really what pivots is this word love, and exactly what. So there's several words in this that I think are really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think love is a very interesting word. Um, I think brother is a very interesting word. I think soul is a very interesting word, and I think there's some interesting things we could say about I as well. Sure. Um, so to, to unpack a little bit, so let's start from the, so the eye is kind of interesting, pupil of the eye, often translated the apple of your eye, I think um, I should actually own up before I say anything more, I'm relying in some ways on this really lovely book, oh, which yeah. you can't read the title of, The Kabbalistic Words of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas by um, Bishop Lewis Kaiser, mm -hmm. um, you know, controversial, the the Bishop Kaiser is a, a, a pretty deep scholar, I think, of um, esoteric and Gnostic Christianity. Mm -hmm. He takes some interesting points of view on the Gospel of Thomas because he uh, distinguishes between sayings which are probably authentic Aramaic sayings of Jesus and sayings which are probably later Gnostic redactions kind of added onto it. And mm -hmm. That's obviously controversial and you can argue about it. So without going into too much of that, um, what's really nice is that he goes into like, what, what does this say in the Coptic? Are they using an actual Coptic word? Are they using a loan word from Greek? Mm -hmm. What's the Aramaic word this probably translates and what does that imply? And what are we being, you know, if we tr try to trace back to the ways in which Jesus might have actually said this, what might he have actually been saying? So it's, it's, it's a really, it's a great little book. It's not a little book, it's a fat book and yeah. I recommend you read it slowly and with a notepad next <laughs> to you because it's very dense. Um, but it's terrific. Um, Sticking with eye just for a sec, so this idea of the, I think the, so the original Aramaic is the, the daughter of the eye, which is a, um, an idiom that means the pupil, the very center of it. Um, the, so there's some interesting things in historical context to kind of understand, I think with a lot of this stuff it's useful to understand the worldview that people both saying and hearing this might have been starting from. So it is different from our own. So this is... Um, so one thing is that the predominant understanding of what was going on with eyes and how we went about seeing was that the eye emitted uh, yes. a kind of a fluid or a beam, mm -hmm. and that's what allowed us to see. It was kind of an active vision was an active thing. Um, that was the sort of Platonic view, and, and that was the sort of general kind of learned view at the time. Um, the Euclidean view apparently was a passive uh, view of the eye, so very much the view that we have today. Um, and that was proved by... An, Arab scientist um, sometime after all this was said uh, and so that's what shifted the, the um, scientific view to a, a passive view of the eye. He mm -hmm. kind of conducted experiments to indicate that there was nothing emitting from the eye. 
The funny thing is actually, um, I think in our modern view, our understanding of vision actually integrates both those views of the eye. As an organic object, the eye is a passive receiver of um, photons mm -hmm. and photons strike the retina at the back of the eye and now the, it goes through the nervous system and into the brain and the brain interprets what the retina receives. But what we understand, um, I think, with later neuroscience is that that act of interpreting what hits the retina isn't a passive act. Right. So the brain's not just sitting there receive, passively receiving um, dots through the retina and, dis, and kind of recognizing immediately what they are. There's an interplay between what we already know and the, pat the patterns we're receiving through the retina that um, has us making sense of what it is that we see. And that, that's how you make sense of all those, um, all those optical illusion things where you yeah. go in thinking you're looking at a certain thing and you see, you know, is it two faces or a vase or is it an old woman or a young woman and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but it also makes sense of why we mistake so many things and why we don't perceive so many things, that, that vision is a, an active process as well as a passive receiving process. Blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's all just marginalia, really. Um, that's what we're here for. Yeah, this is what the Truck Nurses After Dark is about. Yep. After Dark, where well, you can't see. Oh. Oh, see? We did that on purpose, too. I'll take yeah, that for all that. Because you're a genius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so to sort of back up to... Uh, like your soul. So mm -hmm. soul is always an interesting word because it's... So this is, again, one of these things where we think of a human being... So as Western Europeans, we're understanding all of this in the wake of the last two or three hundred years after the scientific enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Particularly, we're seeing this after Cartesian dualism. So we're seeing... We're thinking of the soul versus the body or the soul versus the mind, maybe? Hmm. Is the mind and the soul the same thing, or is it different? And modern talk about interiority tends to kind of spend a lot of time pulling the self apart into, well, you know, there's a body, and there's your mind, and there's your soul, which is the mystically, mystically part that goes on after you <laughs> die. And then my, some people say we've got a spirit, and what's that, really? And we sort of decompose the whole thing into different bits. Um, we're certainly not the first people to do that. Kabbalistic tradition does that, and that's pre-Cartesian. But, um, but it's, this, it's this sort of reductive kind of pulling the self apart into bits thing, which is interesting. Mm. So soul in this sense um, is translating the Greek psyche, mm -hmm. um, which can just as easily mean what we would think of as mind. That's why we talk about psychology. So it's not soul versus mind in this saying. It's soul, or you could say mind. Soul slash mind. Soul slash mind. Um, and the question is, what's the... So if we buy that Jesus is actually teaching in Aramaic, then what's the kind of Hebrew Aramaic term that the Greek psyche is translating? Commonly, psyche's psyche is used to, used to translate nefesh, mm -hmm. which refers to the emotional self. Um, Kaiser claims that in this case it's translating um, leib or labib, which means heart. But the Aramaic notion of the heart is the heart and mind together is an undifferentiated thing. Mm -hmm. Very much so like the, the noose yeah. in, in that kind of a sense. Right, right. And because there's different words being understood by different people from different language contexts, translated often into third languages and then translated into fourth languages, yeah. and each of these words has two or three meanings, someone's got to select one of those meanings to get translated you know, now we're reading, love your brother like your soul. And so it's tempting to kind of go, oh, well, how much do I love my soul? <laughs> do I love my soul a lot? Or do I not love my soul very much? Um, this is, in, as an Aramaic saying, though, the, the plausible interpretation of like your soul is just yourself. <laughs> yeah. The heart mm -hmm. of your being, who you actually are. Love your brother like you, like yourself. It's pretty straightforward. Mm hmm there's no need to go to any of that sort of business, really. Right, which is reflected in the, the kind of canonical New Testament translations of it right. as well. Right, right. And, and it's possible, like the, the first commandment there in Matthew 22, um, it's possible he's just saying, like maybe he's just listing all the, all the potential words that could get translated into <laughs> Greek as something else, you know. Like, just in case all you... Heart, all, all your mind, all your strength, all your everything, right? Just love God totally. 
rather than a checklist. Okay, do I love God with my heart? Yes, okay, I'm good. What about with my soul? Uh, not there yet. Okay, mind. I certainly love mind. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, uh, what does it mean? Okay, so let's take that little first little bit. What does it mean to love yourself then in this context? This is the, this is a really, yeah, I mean, this is a pivotal question. It pivots, okay, so because I'm a translation nerd, it pivots on love. Mm -hmm. Really? So the Coptic, I think, is using, no, it doesn't use a loan word, but it, it's, um, it's a Coptic word used to translate agape. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much whenever you see Jesus saying love anywhere in the New Testament, he's always using, it's always translated as agape. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this, what, what is the kind of love that we're talking about when we talk about love? Um, now agape gets translated different ways. Kaiser makes the, um, makes the interpretation that agape in Greek is translating chesed in Hebrew. So, which often gets translated as loving kindness, I think, when it comes into English. Mm. Um, people are often familiar with it. It's, it's one of the, one of the sephirot in the, in the Kabbalah is called chesed, mm -hmm. the one that corresponds to Jupiter. Um, gracious loving kindness is one way to one way to hear it translated. Um, and Kaiser talks about it as um, respect, honor, respect, mercy, justice. So it's not um, it's not a kind of cuddly, sweet, um, you know, looking after a small child, you know, bouncing people on your knee, you know, holding hands and skipping through the sunset kind of love. It's certainly not erotic love. It's not. It's not that sweet, sentimental kind of love either. It's, uh, as he puts it, covenantal respect. Mm. So it's the kind of love between... <laughs> so, uh, is it like a, like a deep love you experience with someone you've known forever? Mm. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good way to see it. I think, I think, I mean, I experience it in this church often, particularly with other clergy. Mm. That um, even when I disagree with someone, or even if someone said something, you know, they've had a bad day and they've been mean to me, you know, <laughs> said something nasty. Who's ever mean um, to you? Tell me who it is. I'll get them. <laughs> um, you know, we all have our off days and we get into stashes all the time because we care about things. But, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter. There's still this basic container of loving respect and honor and a balancing point between mercy and justice that's always present no matter what else happens. Mm -hmm. It's the ground of everything we do. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's a vivid thing. It's, and it's got, I mean, it's, hmm, it's tempting to kind of make an analogy between kind of the, the love between people serving in the military who've, who've served together through, you know, multiple, um, multiple combat deployments, you know, and mm -hmm. it's not, it's not a nicey, nicey kind of love. It's a, it's a, it's a companionship, but so all those characterizations are kind of thrown into question by this statement because it all hinges on this word brother, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the word translated as brother is sometimes translated as neighbor. Um, and, what you see in that Leviticus quote you read before from Leviticus 19, um, not, don't bear any judge against the children of thy people. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the, um, it, it's talking about neighbor as someone who's a, who's a co-religionist, you know, like yeah. someone else who's, yeah. who's amongst our people. And the New Testament is often a counterpoint between your neighbor, who's the other people, and your brother, who's another Christian. Um, and slowly this turns into, you know, love your brother like your soul. So, Guard him like the pupil of your eye. Obviously, you can't. Obvious, we all understand you can't treat everyone this way. Um, we're just talking about treating other Christians this way. But it's pretty clear when you read the sayings of Jesus, he's talking about everybody. Yeah. yeah. It's the whole point of the Good Samaritan parable that he's not talking about us because there weren't any Christians <laughs> at this point, right? right. right. Um, he's talking about treating your enemies like it, uh, it gets explicit, you know? Mm hmm. Love your enemies. Pray for them. Um, and again, the kind of love he's talking about is honor, respect, mercy, and justice for everybody. 
which was a, not that radical a thing maybe to say now, and yet we commonly fail. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it was a pretty radical thing to say then. Yeah. In a time where affiliations were primarily ethnocentric and um, justice was something that was often only offered to the wealthy. It's quite, it's quite difficult to... It's quite difficult to love yourself in that way, isn't mm. it? I mean, there's, there's um, you're your own worst critic, right? Everybody says that, you know, that, that you see all your own flaws very, very acutely and, uh, and in great detail. Um, so I, I think that's something, and I don't know if maybe this has changed in the modern psyche, but, I, you know, I do see it. Uh, fairly, fairly commonly among people uh, that you know that I know that it's uh, finding finding those qualities in yourself is often harder than finding those qualities in somebody else. I think that's absolutely true. I think that's absolutely true. Um, I think all these sayings of Jesus, this this particular one, and the love your neighbor as yourself, that's in Matthew twenty two, um, they cut both ways, and the the that fact <laughs> that they cut both ways. So there's one thing is like, oh, you've got to love yourself because <laughs> to quote RuPaul from RuPaul's Drag Race, of course, if you can't if you can't love yourself, how in hell are you going to love somebody else? Mm-hmm. Nobody says amen, right? And that's absolutely true. And that's a very that's a really that's a lovely sort of um, <laughs> efflorescence from new, from New Age spirituality. I think it's a good one. I think it's a really it's a decent thing to say for this reason that it it is in, most of us find. We're in this funny situation where a lot of us wind up with a, a psyche where we're, we're on the one hand kind of have this narcissistic self-aggrandizing tendency, <laughs> you know, that uh, I'm amazing you mean and I, Facebook, know, I know right? everything. You're right. If everybody just listened to me, then the whole world would be a better place. I've got that <laughs> in spades. Simultaneous with in the same psyche often, yeah. um, I'm just a worthless piece of shit. And if anyone really knew who I was, then, you know, they'd all hate me. You know, that's, and that's often, and the two things somehow work in a system to kind of yeah. perpetuate each other. And Jesus is pointing to, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> both wrong, basic, basic honor, respect, mercy, and justice towards yourself. I, um, Brene Brown just uh, spoke at the State Theatre here in Sydney last night, and, and my partner Min and I went, and uh, I think on this sort of stuff, she's a really inspiring modern presence. Um, and she says a thing in one of her books, I think it's maybe Gifts of Imperfection, um, it's a kind of a it's a brilliant piece of psychological jujitsu. Um, <laughs> if you find yourself judging yourself harshly, then what you're experiencing is the limit on your capacity for compassion to others. It's not quite how she says it, but mm-hmm. that's that's the essence of what she's trying to say. When you notice yourself judging yourself that way, that's exactly how you, <laughs> that's a mirror of how you're able to to feel about other people. You can't. You can't offer if you if you well and she tin tax right if you're unable to ask for help for yourself, that necessitates that whenever you give help to someone else, you're silently judging their need for it. That that reminds me of something that, and now I, I'm not going to remember who I was talking to, but this this little profound bit of of something that um, if you. Uh, how is it? I'm gonna I'm gonna paraphrase it and get it hopelessly wrong, but here goes anyway. Um, when you are doing something or not doing something, that is a judgment on what other people should do or not do. Uh, so therefore, like I'm going on a diet, say. Therefore, I think that you should also go on a diet because I think going on a diet is objectively good, and therefore I think everybody should be on a diet or eating healthy or whatever the kind of 30,000 foot view of that concept is. And, and I think that, that I think what you're talking about kind of echoes this that or this echoes what you're talking about rather that um, we we have this capacity within ourselves only up to a certain point uh, and then everything else becomes the judgment of something else, of somebody else. Am I making sense? Yeah. Uh, uh, it wasn't You're making very sense. I'm, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to connect it. I guess. Yeah. I think. So I think there's something in. Okay. So this is there's a kind of a, a fairly 
deep aspect of this. To me, I think it's a it's a it's a really critical aspect of this tradition that that rests in self acceptance, and and by that I don't mean that you need to accept yourself with all your your flaws and whatever, right? I mean that's a good starting point, yeah. but but fundamentally the tradition is about transformation. Fundamentally, it's about becoming whole. Mm-hmm. You know, attaining the fullness. Yeah. Um, so we're not even life. talking about the little psychological things like the, you know, like I sneak a pint of ice cream after, you know, after 11 p.m. or something. That's not even, it's, it's almost not no. even relevant to what we're talking about it's here. It's not even relevant. That's all, I mean, that's all, that's all action. And, and Jesus says this himself, you know, like, um, you know, kind of dismisses, well, sure, committing adultery, that's bad. But actually even thinking about someone else mm-hmm. is effectively the same as committing adultery. Even, you know, being bedeviled by the urge to go get the ice cream. This is, we'll get to this when we get to, if we actually get to, get to 27, we'll see how we go for time. <laughs> um, we'll get to this when we talk about my, what my view is going on with the, the cosmos word and mm-hmm. what, what we talk about with cosmos. Because um, I'm always keen to problematize the, the dualism thing, that the dualism is between spirit and matter. And I think it's actually more complex. Okay. But, um, yeah, I... I think part of what the term metanoia to the, it gets translated as repentance into English and these days we often try to translate as to take the higher mind or to take on the higher mind or to, to use Paul's words to take on the mind of Christ is to take on a way of seeing the world where the world is fundamentally undivided. Mm-hmm. Um, the kingdom of God is the world fundamentally undivided. Uh, what in John's called the life eternal. Mm-hmm. Um, Zuonai onum. Um, all these things, all these, you know, <laughs> sneaking ice cream, committing adultery, lying, cheating, stealing, um, getting down on ourselves, judging others, uh, all this stuff. It's all, it's all the result of treating it as true that the world is fundamentally divided, that I am not connected to others, that I am not, that my brother is not my soul, that my soul and my brother's soul are distinct souls, yeah. you know, yeah. and that guarding him is optional. Right, that we don't all partake in that spark of the divine. Right, Mm -hmm. and then we're not all ultimately one in the Father. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say we're all the same thing, or it's all smushed into some kind of, you know, monistic oneness. Mm -hmm. Um, But we are all parts of the same fullness. Um, And the response to that, of course... (laughs) Like if, if you if that's fully accepted in yourself is to is to both love, honor, and respect yourself and all the people around you because you're all aspects of the body of God, mm-hmm. part of the kingdom of heaven, partakers in life eternal, angels standing before the before the throne of the divine. How else could you behave? Right. right. <laughs> and you would guard him as reflexively as you guard the people of your own eye. Him or her. Yeah, yeah. I, that, I, I, can't, I couldn't say it any better. So let's go on to twenty six. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I do this show, so other smart people can say all the things that I don't have to say. Um, so yeah, so uh, the the judge not lest ye be judged. We alluded to it in the video show, but there's a, there are a lot of um, uh, parallels in the in the canonical Bible about uh, judge not lest ye be judged, and uh, he let him without sin cast the first stone, and all of those things. Um, there, is, uh, there, there is some evidence that this might uh, reflect an older Jewish tradition as well. Um, there's a, a, a phrase from the Babylonian Talmud that is almost identical to, you know, remove the chip from between your eyes. He would say to them, uh, remove the beam from between your eyes. As, uh, um, as, a, as maybe even a common saying of the day that was used to kind of illustrate this, um, this concept, which, you know, certainly we know that, uh, that Jesus was doing throughout all of his, uh, his sayings. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, and we covered a lot of that with the, um, you know, what, what does it mean to, uh, to judge whether or not you are qualified to, uh, mm-hmm. to, to 
assist somebody else because what you're talking about is is a is an act of kindness, right? You do want to pull that that moat or that chip out of somebody's eye if they've got one in there. That's not nice to leave it there, but it's like putting on your own airbag before you assist the children and, <laughs> and uh, elderly sitting with you on the airplane when, when the plane goes down. I suppose that uh, you're not doing anybody any good if you're going around helping everybody else at the, ex at the expense of yourself. That's a common psychological thing that people do also. That, um, uh, getting so caught up in, in somebody else's needs uh, emotional, physical, spiritual needs that they don't even take care of their own. I think that we as clergy are, are um, in danger of that a lot of times. Uh, Fortunately, no one in this call has ever fallen into that trap. <laughs> uh, not today, uh, as far as I know. <laughs> so, I mean, sure, taking care of people, but also, I mean, how often do we, do we fall into this thing of um, spending more time advising mm -hmm. or you know, counseling others and, and not spending time in our own stuff, you know, right. cleaning our own windows, taking the beams out of our own eyes. It's, um, yeah, incredibly, com incredibly common human thing. Like, every, we're all better at giving advice than we are at taking it, right? <laughs> that is true. Everybody thinks I think that, that they know the right answers and, and uh, you know, who, who else could possibly know better than I about X, If y, everyone Z. just listened to me, the world would be fine, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> This is very common all, tonight. All, this has come up a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, we're all, we're all secret dictators, surely. <laughs> well, if we, we are, are we're bad at it. <laughs> it's true. We all cho we're children of our father, the Demiurge. Yeah, that's true. The arch dictator. Um, I, I just wanted to pick out that, that saying from the Babylonian Talmud um, is interesting because in a, in a way it's, uh, <laughs> it strangely speaks to our time. But I, I think... Um, I think it's also interestingly back to front. So the um, just for for uh, for listeners, I'm I'm reading from the same notes Father Tony is. So I I don't happen to have the entire Babylonian Talmud in my brain. Just to be clear, <laughs> um, so it was taught. Rabbi Tarfon said, "I wonder whether there is a person of this generation who accepts admonition if someone says to him, remove the chip between you from between your eyes, or possibly eye teeth, depending on how you read it." He would say to him, remove the beam from between your eyes, or eye teeth. So it's, it's kind of like, it's a kids these days saying, right? Exactly. <laughs> and he, and he's, the rabbi's complaining because the kids these days don't seem to, you know, they, they won't take uh, moral guidance from anybody else, or spiritual guidance from anybody else. If someone tries to give them it, they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, get the beam out of your own eyes. Um, so it, it would be funny if that, when's that dated, do you know? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Just off the top of your head? No, it's okay. Um, <laughs> I'd Google, but I don't a, have the internet in here. If that was a common saying, don't worry about it. It's, if it was a common saying at the time, um, then what's kind of amusing is if, is if Jesus is deliberately kind of reversing it um, and actually saying, no, yeah, no, no, seriously. <laughs> if you're going to say, remove the chip from your own eyes, then make sure you remove the beam first. Right. So he's approving of the rabbi's opponents rather than approving of the rabbi. Right. Which is the same kind of thing, right? I mean, like, that's, that's what Jesus is saying here is that there's, there are people who are out there saying, hey, let me get that, that moat for you. And he's telling those people, you know, check yourself first. Yeah, so, I mean, um, Kaiser. Uh, has this labeled as an authentic Jesus saying, and it has the it has that Aramaic kind of vibe that yeah. you get from from old Jesus sayings. Now, I think in support of that, um, this is all through the Desert Fathers. The number of stories in the sayings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers that that parallel this thing, you know, where various you know Abba Macarius or Abba Anthony or someone were, were kind of asked to judge a brother or something, and they kind of yeah. Um, What's the one with that? I think Abba Macarius kind of carries a pot with a crack in it, with water leaking out the entire way from his cell. Um, and they, like, what are you doing, or something? And then the, the pot has no water in it. He says, "Well, this is all the judgment I've got left," or something like that. Hmm. That sounds. It would like... be great if I could convince, convincingly quote more sayings of the Desert Fathers on the matter, but I can't. <laughs> but it, it's um, this thing about not judging others in their own spiritual struggles. Um, yeah. No, that's it. Yep. All right. Uh, that was a terminal. That was a terminal um. That's all I've got. No, I, yeah, I hear you. I have terminal ums sometimes. 
Um, there's, there's a cream for that. Uh, if you uh, if you will it's agree. Topical creams, <laughs> amazing advances in topical creams. It's, it's very, it, you know, it, it's a lifesaver. Let's move on to, to 27 then, since you seem to be excited to talk about that one. Um, <laughs> and I am too. I, like I say, I like this one. Uh, if you do not fast as regards the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as the Sabbath, you will not see the Father. So take it away. Amen. Tell me how I'm wrong about my dualism. Ah, well, you're not. I mean, you're not, <laughs> basically. So there's a couple of interesting things. One, obviously, okay, so me and the words, right? So world is a really interesting word in this. Obviously, Sabbath is an interesting word. Um, and this idea of seeing the Father, I think, uh, I don't know if I've got a lot, of, a lot to say about it, but it, it's kind of it's kind of intriguing. So for, for Kaiser, this is an um, inauthentic Gnostic saying. Uh, <laughs> Inauthentic Gnostic Logion, he, he notes. This is um, loaded with Gnostic ideas. Those crazy uh, Gnostics. Crazy Gnostics. Um, and he's kind of... Yeah, which, which is to say some of these... I mean, some of the things we have preserved as Jesus sayings in various traditions are um, things preserved as plausible sayings of the followers of Jesus that are like the kinds of things Jesus would have said. Sure. In, in the view of the person that, that collects the sayings. So, um, yeah, I don't know. The, the particular, I mean, the particular provenance for the Gospel of Thomas uh, is thought these days to be um, a Syrian monastic community, mm-hmm. an ascetic community in Syria, specifically ascetic, not merely monastic, but right. um, lots of, you know, fasting and uh, physical, um, physical purging, I guess. So a lot of this stuff reflects their particular view of what an authentic spirituality is, and so this is a part of it. So the world in this, in the Coptic uh, text, um, uses a Greek loan word, cosmos, which is quite familiar. Mm-hmm. Um, and cosmos can very legitimately be translated as the world, but it's the same, this is that same dualism between the world, you know, the, the, the world of the pleroma and the world of the cosmos mm-hmm. um, that we see all through our lighter Gnostic stuff. Um, Valentinian stuff and so on. And the que- so the question hinges on what what is he talking about when he talks about cosmos? What does that actually mean? And there's lots of arguments about that. So the when we see world or cosmos um, today, we interpret that to mean physical reality, right? Right. Cosmos, is the stars and the planets, and you know um, our world as it is, our physical world, right? So the and in the wake of um, Descartes, then our temptation is to um, enter into a dualistic thing where there's the world of mind or soul or spirit or whatever in the material world of matter and the two things are you know the mind and the body are split and so the world is split between the spiritual world of god which is the kingdom of heaven and then the the physical world of the cosmos um it's not that clear to me that that's quite how they were seeing it um it seems to be clear to everyone else so i'm clearly an idiot but um (laughs) Well, like I said before we started the call, as the ranking clergy person, you, your opinion is the most right. So, Yeah, but you're the resident genius, so how does this balance out? No, I don't know about I'm that, just, yeah. <laughs> just unclear. Uh, you can join the Father Tony fan club by clicking the link below. <laughs> and donating to our Patreon campaign. Just <laughs> thought I'd mention it. Go for it. <laughs> so it's a reasonable argument that when, whether or not this is Jesus, whether this is just uh, contemporaries talking about the cosmos it, it's quite likely they're talking about the view of the um, spiritual universe as being this kind of bo- uh, you know realm of astrological bondage mm-hmm. uh, in which we're enslaved by the fates given to us by the planets yeah you have to pay extra for that so, downtown that's right <laughs> um so the cosmos in that sense in in one way of seeing it, is less talking about the physical world and more talking about what we call the psychological realm, the psychic world. So it's the, because the consequence of our astrological bondage, um, really, is all the stuff we've been talking about, about the, the various ways in which our psyche's hooked up to compulsions and obsessions and habitual ways of, of judgment and self-doubt and um, all those things that we do that, we don't, that don't make any sense to us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or worse, so, all those things we do that do make sense to us that 
we shouldn't um, do anyway. We somehow can't stop doing anyway, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that which I would, I do not. That which I would not, I do constantly, mm -hmm. said St. Paul. Um, I'm on a Paul jag today. What's up with that? Well, we are talking about talk Gnosticism. That is true. Um, <laughs> so a different way to, to interpret this. Um, so there's a very Greek way of interpreting this, you know, within the sort of Pythagorean, Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition is kind of like... Um, we need to, the, the problem is passions, and so the way we need to diminish the passions is by detaching the noose from the, the physical world, um, going interior, you know, ascending through the, the planes, and, and that's going to deal with these, these, this, this cosmic bondage that we've got. Mm -hmm. And that, that sort of winds up as we've got to get away from the, the physical world. I mean, the, the purpose of it, I think, in a lot of those um, Greek and Mediterranean traditions is not simply the getting away from the world for the because the world's problematic. It's getting away from the world because the impact of the world on the mind creates passions, and the passions are problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a way, the common thread <laughs> um, between this view of the cosmos as being astrological bondage and view of the cosmos as being the physical world that creates the passions. The problem is this psychic world of obsessions and compulsions. There's different theories about where they come from, but the, the thing that's problematic and, um, is the, the ways in which our psyche responds to experience um, in these habitual conditioned ways. Right. And that's a really familiar, that's recognizable to us. It may not have been recognizable to someone in the 14th century, right? But it's really recognizable to us as moderns and postmoderns trying to make our way through the world of Facebook and ice cream and... <laughs> Game of Thrones, you know, <laughs> all these various sticky things that demand our, our um, compulsive obedience. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do not fast as regards the world, so that whole, Father Jordan uh, points out that you can just as easily interpret cosmos as system, and that's true, right? Right. It can also just mean system. So if you do not fast as regards the system, mm -hmm. the whole system of... Um, of obsession and entanglement that's keeping our minds kind of in thrall and preventing us from acting with freedom, um, then you will not find the kingdom mm -hmm. in which all things are revealed to be um, of one of one being with the Father. I'd like to propose. If you do not observe, go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say I'd like to propose an exercise to our listeners. That it's something that I've done that has been helpful to me. That um, you know, in regards to the system. Um, all kinds of things happen to you all day long. You know, you, you get cut off in traffic. You know, you, you lost that big contract. Any number of, you know, you had an argument with your significant other. Um, all of these things happen, I want to say to you, but like they happen around you, right? And you can, you, you have no control really of what's happening around you. But what you do control is how you react to that. So a lot of, a lot of times when I have something that is unpleasant that is happening, I will try to remember to react in a way that is different from what my knee-jerk reaction would be. And of course, you always have that knee-jerk reaction right away, but then if you can recognize that it's happening and then say, I'm going to choose to react differently to this. It's almost like you're short-circuiting the system and you get to see around what that programmed response is and you kind of can start understanding why that's happening and then decide a is that useful to you or b you know should i be looking at uh, maybe trying to change my programmed reaction to that or be more conscious about everything in general anyway which i think is part of the goal but um uh, harder to do in, <laughs> in the longer term for sure for sure for sure i so I'm just going to add on. I, I think there's. I think that's a fantastic um, practice to take up. I, I think there's two really valuable parts to it. Um, one is recognizing what you would typically do, recognizing the conditioned reaction. Mm -hmm. Actually, three parts. Hang on. <laughs> one is recognizing the conditioned reaction. I think a really um, valuable thing, and the more you can do it, I think the the more spontaneity you'll find yourself um, developing, is what am I actually feeling? Because so often one of those triggering events happens and we have a flicker of a feeling that triggers a story to a conditioned reaction and then we're reacting. Right. And that's all happened in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. If you can just take a deep breath <laughs> or a couple of deep breaths and, and just sort of before actually doing the thing that you were going to habitually going to do, 
what what are you actually feeling? Are you frightened? Are you angry? Are you sad? Are you feeling a loss of connection? Are you feeling are you feeling judged? Are you feeling what's going on? Like what's actually happening for you right now? Um, and what's the story you're making up? Mm -hmm. Like what have you decided? You know, you you've got very little data in a situation like that. Like something's just you know, someone cuts you off in traffic. Right. Maybe they just had a heart attack. Yeah. <laughs> and slumped at the wheel, you know. Maybe or someone reality, jiggled it's, them. It's, it's not important. even important. It's not even important what happened. What's important is, in that particular case, it's usually I felt fear, right? Like I felt right. that my life was in danger because uh, suddenly a 4,000-pound vehicle is very close to me, and it wasn't before. Right. You know, and, and to say, oh, okay, I recognize now that that is fear, do I need to be feeling fear right now? And that stops the whole rest of that. The whole chain The whole of it, cascading, exactly. yeah. And I, I'll go out on a limb here. I think this is the beginning of spiritual mastery. I think a lot of people talk about, you know, enlightened masters and all that kind of thing. I, I think the first real, the first real big landmark on that journey is um, being able to consciously interrupt that cycle. Yeah, I mean that's a really common sense definition of awakening. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> instead of instead of drifting through enmeshed in that dream, you know, like you know when you're dreaming, you've got no idea why what's happening to you is happening to you, mm -hmm. and that's how we're going around the world most of the day. Yeah, it, <laughs> that was the symbol that Gurdjieff used, right? That that was that was his main thing, you know, that the people are asleep and they're dreaming, and that only right. and the people who are awake will rule themselves and by definition by by extension rather the world. Right, it's a, it's a pity we're starting stopping at Lodgeon Twenty Seven because Twenty Eight's the uh, I took my place in the midst of the world and I found all them all of them intoxicated. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> we're asleep or we're drunk, one or the other. Absolutely, you know? yeah. Uh, wake up! <laughs> right, if it's just that simple, just just wake up. I mean, I think I read a, a paper somewhere. <laughs> if, it, if it were that easy, everyone would do it. I do want to jump around in the Gospel of Thomas, though, for a minute, if you'll permit me, because every other time that fasting is mentioned in the Gospel of Thomas, it is in a negative context. Um, right. Uh, 14, oh no, it starts at 6. Um, his disciples uh, said to him, do you want us to fast? How should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? Yada, yada, yada. I'm going to skip ahead. Jesus says, don't lie and don't do what you hate. Uh, and that's the answer he gives. It, it, he doesn't say, you know, you should fast, you should pray six times a day, you should, um, you know, uh, wear this particular style of clothing. Uh, because, uh, well, uh, let's, let's, keep, let's continue and then we can make conclusions afterwards. Mm. 14, mm. Jesus said to them, if you fast, you will bring sin upon yourselves. If you pray, you will be condemned. If you give to charity, you will harm your spirits. Um, and so on and so forth. And then one thing that I, I quite like at the end of that saying, uh, after all, what goes into your mouth will not defile you. Rather, it is what comes out of your mouth that will defile you. I like that one quite a bit. 104, they said to Jesus, come, let us pray today and let us fast. Jesus said in classic snarky Jesus, what sin have I committed or how will I be undone? <laughs> Rather, where the groom leaves the bridal suite, then the people will fast and pray. So Jesus is like... Why do you want me to fast? What did I do wrong? I, I think that's fun. Um, so every other time fasting is mentioned in the Gospel, I, in, the, in the Gospel of Thomas, I think they're talking, well, I know they're talking about like physical fasting, you know, not eating, uh, you know, meat or whatever that fasting would have meant to this community. Uh, there's many different kinds of fasting. Um, and as a, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of the spiritual practice of fasting, and, and I, I think that it is useful, um, but I think I know what he's saying here, and we mentioned it a little bit in the video show, that what we're talking about is kind of superficial, look at me, I'm so holy, I only eat fish on Friday kind of thing, uh, mm. that is not, it's, it's, that's not real spirituality, that is just kind of, I'm doing it because somebody told me to, and right. yeah. Right. Um, but I don't think that fasting is, I don't, well, fasting isn't always that. For, certainly isn't for a lot of people. That if you use fasting as an opportunity to constantly check in during the day and think about spirituality and think about what you're trying to do and think about your place in the world and whatever you call the cosmos or whatever, um, that, kind of, that, that kind of ascetic practice and other ascetic practices 
uh, I think can be a very valuable spiritual practice. Yeah, as long as you're doing them awake. Yes. This is the, to come back to what we've just been saying, mm -hmm. like particularly Lodge on fourteen. You know, wake up. Like if you if you do this stuff as empty religiosity from the from a drunken, sleeping, dreaming, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's um, why that's why it's so hard to be a Gnostic. Really, <laughs> it's harder than than other religious traditions, I think, because there is no. Uh, you know, wake up at five in the morning and pray, and then do this, and then wear this piece of special clothing, and then yada yada yada. It's it's a it's a conscious understanding of everything that you're that you're doing, or at least right. trying to. Um, right. That is way way more difficult than believe in Jesus and go to church on Sunday. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And and look at how special you know, we are. <laughs> he's tough in in that. Logion on fourteen. Yes, you know. Yeah. Um, if you if you fast, you'll bring sin on yourselves. If you pray, you'll be condemned. If you give to charity, you'll harm your spirits. So, like, you know, I'm doing this traffic spiritual practice. So what? Yeah. Right. <laughs> why? Exactly. Why? Why are you fasting? Why? Why do you come to communion? Right. Yeah. Why? Why do? You, why? Why do you why watch? You why do okay, you, you do watch weird religious programming on YouTube? Right. Why? <laughs> For? What is it doing? What is it achieving? Mm -hmm. And we've got to be constantly asking ourselves that question. If we're not, then, yeah, we will not find the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? We're out of time. Uh, we didn't even get to a single one of my wild tangents down the bottom of my no. list here. I know. We'll have to do a whole other show on wild tangents. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I know you were looking forward to it. Well, we should do one on on prayer. Uh, you know, we've we've talked about prayer before, but we should really dig in. I think one of these days. But uh, we'll, everything you need to know about prayer is in the Gospel of Philip. But we'll we'll take that up another right. time. Right? Yeah, yeah. We could do a whole thing about the Gospel of Philip after we're done with 114 logia of the Gospel of Thomas, which <laughs> we should be done any day now, right? Number 27. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so, that, so that'll be it for the podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening all the way to the end. I hope that, uh, I hope that we didn't bore you terribly. Um, I know I wasn't bored. That, that's why we do these things. We, uh, you know, we figure that if we're so geeky and interested in these subjects, that there's got to be other religious geeks out there who, uh, who will enjoy this, and, and we hope that you do. If you do enjoy it, you know, uh, it wouldn't hurt to uh, take a look at our Patreon page and, and to help support the Gnostic Wisdom Network as we try and share the light of Gnosis. We are uh, looking to expand our programming. We've got a whole bunch of new and interesting things coming up, uh, but we need your support to do it. So here is my um, semi-annual plug to please go to patreon.com slash gnostic. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash gnostic and uh, take a look at the pledging stuff over there. I'm going to be adding a bunch more rewards and things in the, in the upcoming weeks. So, um, you know, you not only will you get to know you're helping us to do the ministry that we're doing, uh, you're also probably going to get some cool stuff. I just ordered a bunch of stickers. Don't tell anybody. So if you like stickers, who doesn't like stickers, right? All right, but uh, that's it for that. And thank you once again, Bishop Tim, for joining us. And we, uh, we always love having you on the show. And thank you for uh, last minute agreeing to do this. Uh, very, very much appreciate your, your I'm glad time. I'm the, glad the timetable worked out. I just, just uh, I need to add in, I, I, I pledge on Patreon to Gnostic Wisdom Network. You should too. Uh, you, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? <laughs> All right. So then for everybody... Seriously, this is, this is, some, of the, this is some of the best... Um, this is some of the best broadcasting on Gnosticism on the internet, and oh, thank you. Uh, it oh. takes a, it takes an enormous amount of work and a lot of dedication by the people that do it. Um, and if all of us help out a little bit, they can do more. And personally, I want to see more. So, oh, thank you very much. Give. We we love doing it. So, <laughs> yeah, we we will continue no matter what. But there's so much more we want to do, and and. Uh, Gosh, I mean, like, I'm always thinking of new new and interesting ideas of, for shows and things, but there are only so many hours in the day and only so many dollars in my wallet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how these things, that's how the cosmos works, I'm told. <laughs> so apparently, yeah. Yeah. Apparently so That's where we left. So I got to sign off. We got to go. We're wicked overtime. So uh, everybody who is listening along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. 
This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c. 